I now pick and choose. I, I joke with people. I'm like, yeah, the goal is to become Julia Roberts and pretty woman. When you say, you say who, and you say when, you know, that, that, you know, there's like a little <laughs> bell I want to ring every time, you know, someone's like, I'm picking to go to the OR today. It's a Tuesday. And I'm going to the OR today. Cause I chose to go to the OR and then I'm going to work my business. Right. That's fabulous. That is, it's amazing to me. Or when someone says I volunteered in my kid's classroom. Welcome to the plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Join me for some honest, unscripted discussions with other CRNAs who are transforming their financial lives. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now on with the show. Welcome to another Provider Spotlight episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. My guest today is kind of like me in the sense that she is a second degree nurse. She's just, she's killing it with everything she's doing on the side. So I I can't wait to introduce her to everybody today. Uh, Suzanne Jagger is a nurse anesthetist who specializes in outpatient and OB anesthesia. And after 20 years in nursing and 14 as a CRNA, she decided to open up her own aesthetics business, Aura Aesthetics Med Spa. And that was in 2016. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple of years later, in 2018, she started Aura Academy to teach other CRNAs and APRNs how to perform these aesthetic injectables and start their own businesses. In December of 2021, she moved into her own custom-built 2,400-square-foot spa (laughs) in northwestern Portland. And they offer a full complement of injectables as well as laser, facials, body contouring, and IV services. So... Suzanne, that's not enough for her. So she's also (laughs) an entrepreneur organization accelerator graduate and is now a full EO member, having grown her business to over $1 million in gross revenue. She's also currently both injecting in her med spa and traveling to teach injecting and business practices across the country, helping launch nurse-led practices from Alaska to Florida. So there's a lot to unpack there. Let's jump right into it and, and welcome our guest today. Thanks for being here, Suzanne. Thank you for having me. So, you know, I I noticed that you did hold uh, several leadership positions in your first degree, which, you know, you were at the University of Oregon and, Uh uh, and, and got that first degree. So obviously, if you're in all these leadership positions, you you had to have some kind of a mental switch or something that happened that caused you to pursue nursing as a career. What happened? Yeah. Um, You know, it was a classic. i I'm inherently a little bit risk averse. And so I always knew that nursing was like a solid platform. Uh, how, I was partially raised by my grandparents in the depression mindset. And so no matter what was, you know, what can you do to make sure that you can feed yourself? And so nursing became, you know, a surefire way to make sure that I would always have a job. <laughs> and that's kind of where I went with it. Very cool. Well, and then, and then afterwards you, you became a CRNA uh, yeah. several years down the line and you got, I mean, I would think pretty settled into your practice by then. So at that point, it's, it can become easy to become comfortable, but you know, right. Well, you know, I would, I guess one thing that's a little bit interesting for my path is, so I went to U of O, got a degree in chemistry biology, and then I went into the second degree nursing program at Hopkins, which was fairly new back in the day. Um, And then out of our class of a hundred, I was the only one who took a non-clinical job out of school. Um, I went and worked for a healthcare consulting firm. Um, we were a boutique firm that did um, the classic kind of financial and front, what's called front end and back end uh, consulting. And I got to work in projects at Stanford, Rush, Henry Ford, New York Press, uh, Providence Health Systems, um, all across the country. And I got to fly around and see the inner workings of these hospitals and then help them do process flow, process engineer, and actually de- designed one of the first software systems to help case managers work their um, their most depressing cases first, which was a really interesting insight into how businesses work. And so 
But after 18 months of that, I was like, you know, I'm done. If I don't use my degree at some point. So that's when I ended up going back into the ICU. One of the ICUs I actually did consulting for and helped um, optimize their patient flow. Um, Worked as an ICU nurse for six months. Don't tell anyone before I got into anesthesia school. Um, And then here we are. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. A little bit of an interesting job. That isn't it. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, that easily could have led to a a career in healthcare management. Right. Yeah, absolutely. uh, You know, but but. Here you are, and you're actually, I mean, you are managing in healthcare. You're managing yeah. your own business. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you waited a little while before yeah. jumping back we'll into that away. arena. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what what was it that made you pursue aesthetics in particular? Yeah. So after how many years in anesthesia? So I started off in 2006, I think, at, at Kaiser Santa Clara. And then we moved home in 2013 to help raise our kids. You know, it's just a lot easier in Portland rather than the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I switch facilities. And what was so great about the Bay Area was the we had an auto- autonomous practice. Even though we worked with physicians, we were side by side. And um, it was a very, very collegial, supportive relationship. I had leadership roles. I was adjunct faculty, clinical fact- faculty for Samuel Merritt. I was on the wellness committee. I was on um, de- an executive development committee. And so then I thought I'd come help open um, the Westside Kaiser facility up here in Portland. Unfortunately, the culture was not <laughs> what it was in the Bay Area. And after two and a half years of um, many, many meetings with management for insubordination <laughs> uh, by trying to exert some influence over the way things were run, um, it was time to move on. Yeah. Um, so so, but here's the real crust of it. So I took a position with an all CRNA group because wouldn't that be great for someone with um, my spirit, shall we say? Mm-hmm. Um, and while we're on vacation, I get an email while we're on some island off of Fiji says, we lost the contract. Can you go back to Kaiser? You're out of a job. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, we're oh a two-income family. Um, I had just quit my, a, you know, a position. I had, um, you know, a, a pension. And, you know, it was Kaiser. It's pretty much a Kaiser lifer if you want to be. Yeah. Um, so I had to come up with my plan B real quick on an island off of Fiji with poor internet service. And it occurred to me then and there while I'm, you know, swaying in the ocean breeze that, you know, one thing that can never take away from me is Botox. I could stand on a corner and sling Botox and feed my family, which we were not quite that dire. But the premise that, you know, as you switch positions as a CRNA, it can be months to onboard, right? Four months to credential these days. Mm -hmm. Then another month to get a paycheck. It can be five months, six months before you see paychecks when you switch jobs. And I'm not cool with that. You know, to not be the master of my kingdom in that way, financial kingdom was unacceptable. Yeah. So So that's how I decided to get certified. So had, okay. So, but you had not actually um, done anything prior to that with, with no. regards to Botox and stuff like that. No, so- no, no. Thing. I mean, aside from receiving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so okay. yeah, I had, I had been a patient, but in 2016, I decided to get trained. And so I got trained um, by a local injector um, and then realized that there is almost no information on how to learn how to do injectables. In 20, it's amazing how much it's come in these few years of with Instagram, with YouTube, even textbooks. There were two textbooks like in 2016 on how to inject. There was really? just, ab- yeah, there was just nothing, just absolutely mm-hmm. nothing. My, 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 uh, binder that I received from my class training was a, uh, photocopy of the package insert from both from the Botox cosmetic. I mean, it'd be basically like putting a hole punch in the top of your epidural kit and going here, now you can epidural, you yeah. know, yeah. not exactly adequate. So I had to be self-taught. And one thing that I've learned, again, back that consulting background is just fabulous, is I learned how to process flow. I learned how to, uh, you know, make things actionable and just distill a lot of information and and write these things out. And in doing it for myself, I realized, hey, this is what other people need to, which is where the Academy was born. Yeah, well, and that was going to be my lead in, um, you know, so obviously you, you, you decided to create this kind of a flow for other people to make it easier for other people. Were you thinking about the idea of this being a regional thing or were you thinking like, Hey, this could be nationwide. I've got, you know, 
50,000 CRNAs, there's at least, yeah. you know, several, a you know, a handful that, that'll yeah. use this. Um, so that was more your thought process than when you were thinking about my this. thought process was creating it for myself. Like I created a new curriculum to teach myself how to do it because as an advanced provider, no one's going to teach you. So I, what I hear so many from my students is like, well, I want to go get good at it and I want to practice. So the problem is unless you're willing to work for a nurse's salary and work four tens or five tens in someone else's practice earning, you know, a half to a third of what you currently make um, and sign a one to two year contract and sign a non-compete, there's no way you're working for somebody else. So you're going to have to like figure it out yourself and do a good job while you're doing it. So that is why I created the curriculum, um, not only for myself so that I could become the best provider that I could, but then people started messaging me, well, oh, you got out of it. How did you do this? How did you do it? So then I, I literally had like a few people say, you know, I want to come learn from you. I said, okay. And they flew to Portland from all over. Mm -hmm. And um, my first class of four people. Um, and, and then I was like, well, then more people called and then more people mm -hmm. called. And then I was like, well, I got to figure out a way to like deal with this. So then I created a whole like PowerPoint presentation and then it, it has just kind of yeah. grown from there. What I noticed, it, I mean, you, you have been to a couple of state conferences to you know, mm -hmm. present some information on this. Yeah. Um, was that, you know, kind of in tandem with getting this program rolling? Um, yeah. And, well, then, you know, I, I guess that would be the, the question too. Like when you're getting it rolling, how are you thinking, what are you, what's your process about monetizing some of these things? Sure. So how did I do this? So in 2016, I just started kind of doing it and I looked at what other people were charging for training. And I basically, you know, like slapped a number on it, like everyone else. And then, um, and it's, that's not too far from where we're at, it, you know, injectables training kind of has a price point, which is kind of nice and that there's not much to argue with. And so that's basically what it is. Um, uh, and then as far as connecting with other CRNAs, there are only a handful of us in 2016 that were doing it. I mean, I could probably name all the people in the country. There were probably 10, you know, in 2016 mm -hmm. that were injecting. And so we kind of found each other, which is how we got into the state, you know, going to Idaho. Um, that was a great conference. And there were in different states have different laws that are far more amenable to CRNAs pursuing this as a as a side business. Um, that's a whole discussion of itself is compliance. Um, but we, we connected and we have a nice little network of CRNAs that um, kind of bounce things off each other. And now it's, you know, and it's in the last two years, it's just absolutely exploded. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with that because, I mean, we, we've had several folks that are on here that, I mean, I, I didn't bring them on to the show necessarily because I knew anything about their aesthetics business. But it just so happens that they have that on the side as well. And it, yeah. it's, I mean, it, it seems like it's a, a relatively simple thing to kind of get started, um, yeah. you know, because you can, it, it's client based. So you just right. start working within your network and you build up that client base. And then, you know, so, so where does it, what is the potential for where it goes from there? Um, Absolutely. You know, just reaching out to your network to, to what? Yeah. So let's talk about, I, I like to tell people when I do introductory calls, there's kind of like three different ways you can go about this. And it's, you can either go all in from the beginning, or you can do it in a totally scalable stepwise manner. And it can be the way that I did it, which is essentially, I took a injecting class and I want to also preface that there is no such thing as certification in injectables. It is the wild, wild west. There is no certifying body. Anyone who says they certify you, it is a piece of paper that you could just as well print out yourself and self-certify it. It is meaningless. So you, it, the onus is on you to learn your skill set from somebody who's skilled enough to be able to confer that knowledge. You know, um, so at any rate, there be wary of people saying you're certified. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist anyway. Um, so you, to start your business, if you'd like to, one, you need to know if you have practice autonomy in your state. All right, if you have practice autonomy in your state, that means that you are considered an an APRN, um, an advanced practice provider, you're able to do your own tin takes and even better is when you have your own prescriptive authority, life gets pretty easy for you in this business. And then in the states where it's quite not quite so clear, it gets into the gray area. And that's a lot of why I have a business course to help understand what the rules and regulations are in your state, which in all but like five states is horribly gray. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just say that you can do this. What does your business look like? It looks like that you can make it as small as traveling around and with a little kit in your car and going into people's homes and doing their Botox, you know, or any neurotoxin. I don't mean, but I use the mm -hmm. word Botox like I use Kleenex. Um, yeah. And it's infinitely <laughs> scalable. It's basically only limited by your time and ability to market. Yeah. Um, 
so that's kind of step one. Step two is, you know, I want to get more involved in this and I'd like it to grow better. And in which case driving around is a poor use of your time. Um, it's nice to have a little tax deduction and have a space where people can come to see you. So you rent a room in a salon or a yoga studio, or I had a great place in the back of a dentist's office. Okay. hundred square feet. Right. Um, so do that. And then you can schedule your block off your hours, you know, what, and I say, you know, block at least two, four hour blocks a, a week so that you're seeing people on Tuesday afternoons and Saturday mornings, at least something so you can see people two days a week. And you have a nice little tax deduction, a cute little office. It looks more professional. You have a place for things to be delivered. It makes your life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a ton of overhead. Um, and then the next thing is you go for something that's a full-blown med spa, right? And that's a yeah. huge, big capital investment. And I have to chuck a little bit. People are like, yeah, I want to open a med spa. I go, great. Do you have 250000 to a million dollars? I mean, because that's the yeah. investment to get going. Well, that chair <laughs> behind you looks really nice. Yeah, it, that chair alone is 2500 dollars <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and that's the so, thing is like you, you see these these places. And, and I think that's why a lot of people choose to try and get on with a salon or something. Sure. That, you know, hey, they've already got some of that equipment in place. So right. Um, yeah, you know, and that's totally a great option. Someone that does eyebrows or lashes and use it with, or a massage uh, table someplace that they're and then use the off hours is a great way to start with low yeah. overhead because low overhead is everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. That's well, there's less risk in it as yeah. a, a potential business owner, you know, because yeah. you don't have to put as much of your own money into it. So right. um, I, I do want to, you know, go back a little bit because you, sure. you mentioned compliance issues. So I, on a state to state level, yes, of course, that's very different because we're talking practice autonomy for APRNs. That is very different on a state to state level. But um, is there, uh, I guess, a resource other than like the AA and A where you can go find out some of this information about, you know, what's, where can you practice and, you know, how can you practice in certain states and what's happening? Is there anything happening to providers who maybe are a little bit unscrupulous? <sighs> or scrupulous. Yeah. I, I, I have to yeah, clarify. I, I don't know no, whether I know. unscrupulous, scrupulous. I, you know what I mean. I, yeah, I, I get not, it. Sometimes I use five dollar words, and <laughs> and I don't really know what they I mean. Gotcha. It's good. I'm just having a sip of coffee here. We'll think about it. <laughs> I try to sound smarter than I am sometimes. It worked for me. It worked. For me. So <laughs> all right. So there's a few things. One is that unfortunately there is no central clearinghouse for the be all to end all rules and regulations for aesthetics practice. Mm -hmm. It's a lot clearer for nurse practitioners. And as we know, we are the redheaded stepchildren of the nursing world. And therefore we are always kind of this like de facto asterisk afterthought. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a central place? The answer is no. Um, what my friend Cassie Lane has done at Injectables EDU is put a ton of effort and work. And I hope you link to that in the show notes because she's amazing CRNA who I actually trained and then has taken off in doing, um, creating a huge resource for all APRNs and CRNAs about, you know, how to get your practice started. So that's yeah. InjectablesEDU.com. Um, and she has tried to kind of condense down some of the rules. The biggest thing is what I said is whether you have practice autonomy, whether you have prescriptive authority, that's really where it goes. And then in states like California, Texas, and Florida, they have very, very specific med spa laws. Um, and states like uh, New York and um, I think Pennsylvania just flipped and that they were not even working under their advanced practice license. Um, I think Pennsylvania just got that changed, but I think New York is still the holdout of, you know, CRNA still working under an RN license. Anyway, um, okay. that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you, there is again, no place. Another resource that is fantastic is called AMSPA the, and that's the American, um, oh God, I always mess it up. AMSPA, A-M-S-P-A.com. Um, they have a legal arm called Bernadotto uh, that have become the, again, de facto kind of legal arm of the aesthetics world. Uh, they are very knowledgeable. They are very expensive. Um, okay. And they will do a, and I, again, I want to, this is a little asterisk too. They'll do a complimentary phone call with you to, you know, if you join as a member uh, to see whether, you know, to discuss legal issues. The thing is, it's, it's um, a little bit of a, sales pitch so that they can charge you $2,500 to find out whether you can practice legally in your state. Uh, you're like, great. Um, and then they'll come back and say, maybe, because that's how most of it is. Because <laughs> their job is to be like, this is how risky it is. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing you asked about was compliance. And 
AMSPA does an annual state of the like med spa industry poll. And in 20, I think their 2019 survey, um, one out of three med spas does not have a proper medical director. Um, so compliance issues run rampant in this industry. And because there is no certifying body, there's no agency, it's variable from state to state. There are many, many people running under the radar and maybe they're doing best practice in running under the radar. Maybe they're not, you know, mm -hmm. it's a mess, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, it does sound a bit like the wild, wild west. And, and that's what happens when you have huge growth in a very short yes. period of time. Yeah. And and so it's not exactly unexpected, but I, I guess I would expect that some of that stuff will eventually uh, start to sort itself out. Right. And AMSWA is working on it. They are trying to create a standard of care, uh, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Unfortunately, it's mostly physician driven because that's where the money is and every business is money driven. So yeah. they are much more beholden to the plastic surgery industry than the nurse led practice industry. Mm -hmm. But there are great people at that table who are are um, advocates. Um, I'm also working with, um, some people within the ANA to help see what we can do for our people. Um, I'm not at liberty to yet disclose where we're at on some of it because we're working it on the back end. but do you know that those conversations are happening on a national level mm -hmm. to try and support CRNA practice in this industry because that hasn't happened in the past, but, uh, we are making some progress, um, and then hopefully create some care standards, at least for even CRNAs to protect us and protect our patients. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a twofold thing, right? That's what the whole point of creating standards of care and creating, um, practice standards is really important. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that that kind of brings us back to, I mean, you know, I was very active politically when I was, uh, practicing and, and so, uh, it's something where as the AA and A continues to try and strengthen the state level organizations, um, and, and these practice issues can get sorted out from state to state, um, you know, that that's going to create the room for these businesses to really flourish. So, yes. um, you know, for those people who aren't necessarily politically active, well, this could affect your pocketbook if you're looking into this kind of a side business. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Very much. Please be involved in the state level. I'm super involved trying to um, just had a meeting with our PAC person yesterday to see what we can do and go to your advocacy days because things like furnishing privileges don't sound like a big deal until you own a clinic and mm. things like, you know, um, your prescriptive privilege doesn't matter when you're working in the hospital. But right now, guess what I'm going to Salem to talk about to make sure that I protect my prescriptive authority because we had an issue with the state of Oregon where the receptionist was questioning whether or not CRNAs had prescriptive authority and telling them no over the phone. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're the receptionist. <laughs> like <laughs> it's here in the state law over here that yeah. I have prescriptive authority. So yeah. excuse me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So please be vigilant and protect your practice yeah. because if you don't, they'll take it away. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and, and, um, so I, I have to ask another question and I've not Dude. asked anybody else on my show that's oh. talked about aesthetics, this, um, All right. I, I saved it for you. Thank you. Um, so I'm a guy, right? Yeah. Like what, what do I care about aesthetics? Oh my like, gosh. What, what is, what the guys is, are killing it? No. So that's the question. Like what room is there for guys in this business? Huge. Cause it seems like all I see are women talking about this stuff. Yeah. Where's the room for guys? What yeah. what in the world does it look like to be a guy in this space? You know, I I have many uh I've trained quite a number of men. I you know gr granted it's disproportionate women, but I'd say 10 to 15% of the guy people I train are men. Um one of my close friends is Rick Young in Tampa, Florida. He owns Forever Young Aesthetics. He's doing an amazing job. He just has a beautiful spa. Um he's doing great work. And you know, there are some people, some women in particular, who don't want to be treated by another woman. They'd rather be treated by a man. They don't want to deal with, they just feel more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it really has more to do with your personality, with your skill set. And the more you get into aesthetics, the more you realize it's not a vanity thing. It really is a treatment. It really is something that you study and learn how to administer. And it is not... I don't even know how to say it. it isn't a vanity thing. It's helping people's outside match their inside. And that's yeah. really what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you mentioning that too, because yeah. that's, that is an easy trap that people fall into. Yeah. And, and there can be a lot of shaming that goes on. I mean, there's shaming for everything online, if we're Ugh. being honest. So, right. I mean, you know, it's, it, but, but there, there has been, I, I've seen some shaming with regards to aesthetics and, and Botox and, you know, guys coming in and, and mansplaining, why do you feel like you need to do this? To and it's like, well, it's not your choice, 
it's buddy. not your choice. You know, yeah. like it, who cares what you think? They're not, you know, people aren't doing this to impress you. No. Um, you know, and and they're not even doing it to impress themselves or or anything like that. It, again, what you said, it's about making the outside match the inside. That's and exactly so, what we're doing. I, I love the way that you put that. Um, yeah, thank you. You know, I've I've never actually really heard it put that way, but that is a a beautiful summation of it. But um Okay. You're staying busy. Obviously you've got a lot of irons in the fire. How in the world are you juggling all this? Um, wow. Are you still working full time or are you like, Oh no. (laughs) Okay. I didn't, I didn't think uh -uh. you were. Um, are you working even part-time in uh, anywhere? I still have a couple of per diem gigs that I make a cameo at. Um, uh, but mostly I'm in the spa you know, gotcha, and, do, gotcha. and teaching. That is what I do 24 yeah. seven. Um, you know, the number one thing to be able to do all this is I have a partner that is wholly supportive on the home front and mm-hmm. able to, I have two kids and without him being fully on board with this, there's no way I could do what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That, so I'm super grateful. And for the single moms out there, single dads, you know, it is, you're going to need help if you want to take on an entrepreneurial venture and have a family. You just will. And it's not a failure on your part that you can't do it all. I, mm-hmm. I, that, it just crushes me when people are like, I don't, I, I can't, I, you know, it's something's falling apart. I'm like, no shit, something's falling apart. It is an unreasonable <laughs> expectation. All right. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's your health, whether it's your family, whether it's your social life, whether it's business, what something will give. So how you have to pray play appropriate attention to each of the things and where your focus is, is what grows. Right. So, um, there's a couple things. One is I have a life coach and I know that sounds so completely woo woo, but without having somebody to help me reframe my perspective on things, um, I don't know that I would be, I know I wouldn't be where I'm at today Mm -hmm. because we all have these little gremlins or this little person, like, who are you to do this? Or why do you think you can do that? Or, um, uh, it just get your head straight about things, um, I think has been invaluable. And so I have, I chat with her every two weeks, um, just to keep focused on mm-hmm. what's most important to me and put my attention where it should be. Um, the other thing that I'd like to throw out there is that, um, you can't do it all. If you are working full time and you think I'm going to just start a business and I hear this one, I'm going to continue working full time. And then I'm going to start my aesthetics practice so I can be home with my family more. And it's, <laughs> no, I, I love it though. I, I cause it, that's exactly right? what folks think. You hear it yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. 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 And you're like, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't a math major and that math don't work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, yes. You can have more flexibility, but no, you're not going to have air quotes more time. Yeah. Um, and that where you put your attention is what grows. So you have to cut something off. If you are working five tens in the OR, there is no way that you are going to start a successful business and see your family and maintain any kind of sleep and health. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work, right? Uh, Something will crack. So if you want something to grow, you need to put your attention to it. And that means trying to find another job that maybe is a 312 sort of situation. So you have some days off. Maybe it's hiring some help so that you don't have, that you have that extra day off. Maybe it's cutting back on something else so that you don't have to generate as hard, Mm -hmm. but something you have to give in order to take and you can't just take. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And so, um, you know, I, I know that we're kind of getting close to, to wrapping up here, but I do want to, I want to focus on your Academy here. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously this has been a, a rewarding journey for you. Um, what's been the most rewarding part for you with, with having not just the, the aesthetics business, cause obviously that's, that's pretty cool to be able to directly affect people's lives in that way, but, but having the Academy and affecting people across the country, what's been yeah. the coolest part of that? I mean, every time I hear someone say that I quit my full-time job mm-hmm. and I now pick and choose, I, I joke with people. I'm like, yeah, the goal is to become Julia Roberts and pretty woman. When you say, you say who, and you say when, you know, that. That, you know, there's like a little bell I want to ring every time, you know, someone's like, I'm picking to go to the OR today. It's a Tuesday and I'm going to the OR today because I chose to go to the OR and then I'm going to work my business, right? That's fabulous. That is, it's amazing to me. Or when someone says, I volunteered in my kid's classroom. When was the last time some of you have been able to volunteer in your kid's classroom? Because you've been in the OR or you've been able to go to their like birthday party or whatever, something that you're there that's critical for 
this this moment that you couldn't have done before is just fills me with such joy. Yeah. I, anyway. Oh, I love that you mentioned that though, because that's that was one of the big things for me. Um, you know, being a stay at home dad was, you mm -hmm. know, I could I could go and and take my youngest daughter at the time and go meet one of my other kids for lunch. You yeah. know, and and it's like, wow, this is really cool. I yeah, you know, my parents were never able to do that. No. And you know, it, it's just it's a neat moment to see their eyes light up when you walk in the door and, and do stuff. And so that's really cool. Um so I and and again uh, a question about your academy. Um, yeah. Obviously, it's it's doing people right. What is it yeah. that you guys are doing so well that that maybe you know some other programs aren't exactly offering? Yeah. So one thing I'd really like to stress is that anyone who wants to get educated in this, going to someone that's a small provider is superior to one of the big ones. So when you Google aesthetics training, there's going to be like five things that show up and they're all big national programs. And their job is to create the, to feed the monster, which is the big plastic surgery centers, the big ideal images. And that's who they are training to. They are not training people to be solo providers and they have to train to the lowest common denominator, which is an MA. Because in some states, a medical assistant can inject here in Oregon an MA can inject legally I know okay it's insane so if you can imagine if you go to one of those kind of training programs that they they have to really start with this is the pointy end of a syringe mm -hmm. as opposed to being able to dive into the high level um you know physiology pharmacokinetics understanding that you know the the real reason what we're doing and how we're doing it so that's the one thing um two I really focus on being a solo provider, which means you need to know it all. You need to know it all. It's not deferring to the doctor to know something. So we were gonna understand assessment in and out. And so it's very, very didactic heavy because again, anyone can poke a syringe into someone's face. That is not where the mystery lies. It's in the why, the how, the assessment. So we spend a lot of time on that. And the third thing that's really a differentiator is that I spend a lot of time on the business side of things because we are all clinicians. Unless you went to business school, you don't know a lot of this stuff. Um, so I really want you to understand what cash flow means and what gross versus net means and what your cost of goods are. And so we dive into that whole business section because if anyone's telling you that you're going to make it rich quick on this and you're going to earn, if anyone's leading their class with, and you'll see this at one of the big box ones too, and even some smaller ones, you're going to make $10,000 a day and you're going to you know, be able to replace your anesthesia income and you're going to be able to quit within three months. You know, Have people done it? Sure. Is that the norm? Of course not. Yeah. That is not the norm. It, both Botox is not a Chick-fil-A. You don't build it and they don't come. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. All I know. Right, that made me Chick chuckle. Chick-fil-A is fabulous though. I was just yeah, there yesterday yeah. with the kids. So oh, all right, not goodness. Sunday because they're not on Sunday. Saturday. But at Saturday. any rate. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> um, was great. Yeah. So please, you know, kind of vet, speak to people that went to their class, tell what they heard um, and, and ask questions and see if people are available to you. And do they have ongoing, you know, mentorship or are they available? Because it really is a community. Um, you know, one other thing that comes up is I don't want to, you know, if anyone's like, I don't want to train you because you're down the street. Look at hairdressers, nowhere, it's a bunch of hairdressers and they all cut hair, right? They're all in a salon, they're all in chairs next to each other. And not once did they say, don't look at the way I cut bangs. Mm -mm, this is the way I cut bangs. Mm -hmm. Like it's not protected. This is not, people come to you because of who you are. That's what you're selling is your experience, which is different than Sally's experience and Tessa's experience, right? So people come to me because they like, I'm a straight shooter. If they want a airy, fairy, fluffy, they're gonna go someplace else. I just know that. And maybe you can do that and that's great. <laughs> well, and and so that speaks to the the competitiveness or lack thereof, really, mm -hmm. in the marketplace because there's enough business for everybody. It's there, still everyone, at this point, we, it is still we are still in the beginning of the growth curve in aesthetics. We have less than ten percent market penetration. That means that wow. only ten percent of people eligible for an aesthetics treatment has ever received one. So you haven't missed the boat. I know it feels like star, you know, Starbucks and aesthetic centers are kind of like mm -hmm. ubiquitous, but it is not. And most of the providers are bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. they are poorly trained, unknowledgeable, and doing a very shit job. I'm sorry. You're anyway, fine. Um, it's an adult podcast. I fantastic. put that on there. <laughs> so, you know, if you care and yeah. you do a good job, yeah. you're already ahead of the game. Yeah. 
Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. I, I I want to give people the chance to get a hold of you. How can they do Please. that? Please. Yeah. So a couple different ways. First of all, um, you can find us. Our spa is Aura PDX, A-U-R-A-P-D-X.com. You can check out our spa site. Um, the teaching site is Aura-Academy.com. So that's A-U-R-A-Academy.com. And you can always reach me. Um, I'm Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E at AuraPDX.com. But you can uh, hit the contact page on any of those things and uh, get to us. Or my helpful, my office manager manager Joni is a godsend and she's, she can always help people out. <laughs> Very cool. This has been such a pleasure. Um, I really appreciate you being here uh, today and giving us some of these really helpful insights into the aesthetics business. Awesome. I'm glad I could be here. Thank you so much. This conversation had some twists and turns for me and I felt like that was a great thing. Uh, Suzanne brought up a really broad scope of issues, which just shows how well-rounded she is with her self-awareness and business acumen. And it's clear to me that the success that Suzanne has created for herself stems from the ability to examine herself and her surroundings. But she doesn't do this alone. Her reliance on the expertise of others, such as her life coach, is vital to her success in business and life. Suzanne also mentioned something that's near and dear to my heart, practice autonomy and prescriptive authority. These two issues are fought on a state-by-state -state basis, but they can be the difference between your ability to take on this side hustle or not. In some states, the hurdles may be too great, which means that the laws must be fought. This is a long, expensive, and arduous process, but it's often worth it to get the autonomy that CRNAs deserve. Small monthly contributions to your state and national PACs can make a big difference when combined with that of other CRNAs. Engagement with your state legislators is often much easier than you'd imagine, but many are afraid to engage. I'd encourage you to break out of that mold. One key relationship can have benefits for years to come. That's going to do it for this week's episode. I'll see you next time. And as always, be safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page, where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.